Amen. Well, it's going to be back on the radio again today. We certainly do appreciate the good Lord allowing us to be able to come to you by means of radio. This is the Bear Trail Baptist Church broadcast, and we certainly are privileged to be the pastor there with the Tim Crotts. And we thank you so much for tuning in to our radio program on each and every week. We hear from folks often every week. In fact, we hear from folks who listen to us on the radio, and we're extremely thankful and grateful for this open door. And we thank you so much for listening and for letting us know that you do so. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer here in just a moment. But before we do, I'd like to make one announcement for those of you who live locally here uh, near where we're located. The Little Mountain Baptist Church where Brother Bill Watson is the pastor and has been the pastor there for numerous years. They're having revival August the 20th through the 25th. Brother Barry Wall, or Evangelist Barry Wall, I should say, will be preaching. He'll be preaching Sunday morning and Sunday evening on the 20th, and then Monday through Friday, each night at 7 p.m. And on Friday, the 25th, they'll be having a morning service at 10 a.m. and lunch following the morning service, and then the afternoon service as well. There'll be different singing groups involved in the meeting each night as well. And this is their annual Summers in um, revival. So be much in prayer for the revival there at Little Mountain Baptist Church and Brother Bill Watson, the good pastor there. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Ask the Lord to help us today. We're going to continue right in Psalm 36. Father, we do love you. We certainly thank you for this opportunity. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us today to be a blessing uh, to you. Pray you'd help us to be an encouragement and a help and a blessing to God's people. And Father, for all that you do, we'll certainly not fail to give you the praise, give you the honor, and give you the thanksgiving, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We started in Psalm 36 on last week's broadcast. I would like to read the entirety of the psalm again, only 12 verses. We'll make mention just briefly of what we covered in last week's broadcast, and then we'll get right into the sermon today. The Bible says in Psalm 36 and verse number one, the transgression of the wicked saith within my heart that there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes until his iniquity be found to be hateful. The words of his mouth are iniquity and deceit. He hath left off to be wise and to do good. He deviseth mischief upon his bed. He setteth himself in a way that is not good. He abhorreth not evil. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God! Therefore the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. They shall be abundantly satisfied with the fatness of thy house, and thou shalt make them drink of the river of thy pleasures. For with thee is the fountain of life, in thy light shall we see light. O oh, continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in heart. Let not the foot of pride come against me, and let not the hand of the wicked remove me. There are the workers of iniquity fallen. They are cast down and shall not be able to rise. On last week's broadcast, we talked about the first part of the psalm. We mentioned that the psalm could be easily divided into three sections. The first four verses of the psalm is exposure. It has to do with the wickedness of the human heart. What we want to look at today is the second part of the psalm, the body of the psalm, and that is exaltation, the excellency of God's heart. That's verses 5 through 9. So we're talking about exaltation. Our God is certainly worthy to be exalted. Amen. The Bible says, Thy mercy, verse number 5, O Lord, is in the heavens. Now notice this, And thy faithfulness, reacheth unto the clouds. Verse 6 says, Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep, O Lord. Thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men 
put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Now, David did a wise thing here when he stopped focusing on the sinner. I made mention that the first four verses of the psalm had to do with the wickedness of the human heart. David has stopped focusing on the sinner or on the wit, uh, wicked, if you will, and, uh, and their wickedness and, and sin, and he started focusing on the glories of the Lord. Now, this is important because knowing and understanding the character of God and focusing on that instead of on what is going on around us or what's going on in the world is extremely important to a balanced Christian life. What we see here, we have five of the Lord's many attributes mentioned in verses five, six, and seven. We see his mercy, we see his faithfulness, we see his righteousness, we see his judgments, and we see his loving kindness in these three verses. Now listen, these are some of the reasons man trusts in the Lord and are abundantly satisfied. Verse number five, again, the Bible says, thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. Now, I'll say this, and the majority of you who are listening are probably very well aware of this fact, and that is that a, the Bible has a great deal to say about the Lord's mercy, and we certainly are not going to turn this psalm into a study on the topic of mercy, but we will look at several things briefly from the Bible concerning the mercy of the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 86 and verse number five, it says, for thou Lord art good and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. I am certainly thankful that the Lord's mercy is not in short supply. That Psalm 86 and verse number five that we just read said that he is plenteous in mercy. And so we'll look at several things, one, two, three, four, five things briefly about God's mercy. Now, as I mentioned earlier, this is not meant to be an exhaustive study on mercy that would take a lengthy time in and of itself. I just want to mention a few things about the mercy of God. First of all, his mercy is eternal. The Bible says in Psalm 103 in verse 17, the Bible says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him and his righteousness unto children's children. Now, the Lord's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him. And so once again, in the Bible, as we've seen numerous times up to this point, and as we'll continue to see throughout the study of the Bible, we see the importance and the necessity of fearing the Lord. The Bible says in Psalm 106 and verse number one, it says, praise ye the Lord, O give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. There are so many things we could say about that phrase that is repeated often in the Bible. And we are to praise the Lord. We are to give thanks to the Lord. We have a reason for that. He is good. I am thankful that we have a good God. I am thankful that we have a great God. I am thankful that we have a merciful God. In fact, the reason listed here for us, for one of the things that the reason that we can say that he is good is the Bible says for his mercy endureth forever. Now there's a Psalm in the Bible, Psalm 136. That Psalm consists of 26 verses and every single verse of that psalm ends with the phrase, for his mercy endureth forever. I am grateful for the fact that the mercies of the Lord are eternal. Now, the mercies of the Lord are eternal. They're also boundless. Our text verse in Psalm 36 and verse number five says, thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens. And the Bible says in Psalm 108 and verse number four, it says, for thy mercies are great above the heavens and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Psalm 119 and verse 64 says this, 
The earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. And so we made the comment or we made the statement concerning the fact that the Lord's mercy is boundless. These three verses that we read in the Psalm teach us that his mercy is in the heavens. His mercy is above the heavens and the earth is full of his mercy. And so according to these verses, it is impossible for those that fear the Lord, thinking back to a previous psalm to be separated from the Lord's mercy. Apparently, those who are in hell are the only ones who are separated from the mercy of the Lord. His mercy is eternal. His mercy is boundless. Now, a third thing we see just quickly is that his mercy prolongs life. The Bible says in Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 22, the Bible says it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Listen, if the Lord were not merciful and compassionate toward us, we would all be dead. And the amazing thing is that they are new every morning because of the faithfulness of the Lord. Listen, if it were not for the Lord's mercies, we would be consumed. I'm glad that he is a compassionate God. He is a merciful God. And I'm glad that those mercies are renewed every morning. You say, preacher, why are the mercies of the Lord? Why, why is it necessary that they be renewed every morning? I promise you, friend, you and I need mercy for every single day. And I'm glad that there is a continual renewing of the Lord's mercies upon our life. And so God's mercy is eternal. God's mercy is boundless. God's mercy prolongs life. And God's mercy encourages repentance. Hey, the Bible says in Joel chapter number two and verse number 12, the Bible says, therefore also now saith the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning, verse 13, and rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord your God. Now listen, why would anyone be willing to rend their heart and turn toward God? I'll tell you why. I won't tell you why. The Bible tells us why. For he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. And so the mercy of God is one of several things that the Lord uses to encourage us to repent. Now, the New Testament, the New Testament, the Bible states it, in this manner, the Bible says in Romans chapter two and verse number four, it says, or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of the Lord leadeth thee to repentance. And so we can say, praise the Lord for the mercy of God that encourages repentance. I'm glad God's mercy is eternal. It endureth forever. I'm glad that God's mercy is boundless. It's in the heavens. It's above the heavens. The earth is full of the mercies of the Lord. I am thankful that the mercy of the Lord prolongs life. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. It is of the Lord's mercy that encourages you and I to repent. He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Now, here's the last thing I'll mention concerning mercy. And again, it's certainly not the last thing that we could say about the mercy of God from the Bible. But I will mention just one more thing, and that is that mercy makes salvation possible. The Bible says in Titus chapter 3 and verse number 5, the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, 
He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Listen, if it were not for the Lord's mercies, we would be eternally lost. Listen, no one deserves to be saved. None of us are good enough to be saved, but because of his mercy, he saved us. There was not one of us that was good. None of us were seeking after God. We had all together become filthy. We have no righteousness at all whatsoever. We are outcasts. We have no, as Gentiles, we had no God and no hope and no covenant. We had nothing, friend, but I am thankful for the mercy of God that brought salvation or made salvation possible for you and I. And so we are thankful for the mercy of God. Come back to our Psalm, Psalm 36. Look at verse number five. That's where we are. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth under the clouds. So the Bible talks about his faithfulness reaching under the clouds. Hey, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, in verse number nine, the Bible says God is faithful. And so God is faithful by whom ye were called under the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, listen, there is no way to estimate the calamity that we would all experience if it were, if the Lord were not faithful. Listen, his faithfulness keeps the entire universe going the way that it should. Plus, we, we would have no fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ if God were not faithful. Listen, friend, we would not survive one day apart from the faithfulness of our God. Listen, the, the sun would not rise and the moon would not rise and the sun set and the tides change and, and the earth rotate. And listen, I am thankful for the faithfulness of our God who is sustaining not only our life, but life on this planet in general, man. He is a faithful God. I'm thankful that we have fellowship with God or fellowship through our Lord Jesus Christ with God because of his faithfulness. Hey, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse number 3, the Bible says, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And so this verse says that the Lord will establish you. You know the word establish means? It means to fix. It means to settle in a state for permanence. It means to make firm. It means to establish a man. Listen, I'm not established because I am faithful. I am not settled in a state of permanence because I am faithful. I am established because the Lord is faithful. Amen. Hey, the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 11, the Bible says it is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Listen to verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Listen, this is a great truth. This is a great, this is a phenomenal thought, friend. Our unfaithfulness does not alter the faithfulness of God. Now, certainly do not misunderstand me. I am not encouraging. I am not promoting unfaithfulness. But I want you to understand, friend, that my unfaithfulness and your unfaithfulness does not alter the faithfulness of God. I praise the Lord for this great Bible truth, and that is the fact that our God is faithful. Hey, the Bible says in Revelation 19, in verse number 11, the Bible says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he doth judge and make war. And so one of his many names is faithful. Our God is merciful and our God is faithful. Now, come back to Psalm 36 again. Psalm 36. 
Verse number six, the Bible says, Thy righteousness is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. Now listen, the Lord's righteousness is as firm and towering as the great mountains. Now, the analogy here is that no one will ever be able to reach the height of God's righteousness. We must have his righteousness imputed unto us. Listen, the Bible talks about our righteousness having to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees. Listen, the only way that that is possible is because we are clothed in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ at the moment of salvation. And so I am thankful that God is righteousness. It is like the great mountains. We'll never be able to reach the peak of that great mountain. We'll never be able to exhaust the righteousness and the holiness of our great God and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a merciful God. He is a faithful God. He is a righteous God. Amen. Then that same, that same verse, it goes on to say, thy judgments are a great deep. And so we understand that his judgments are inexhaustible. And just as the mysteries of the depths of the sea, there are many things under the ocean that are still uncovered. There are many things under the sea that are still unknown. Now, I promise you, friend, we'll never get to the depths of the judgments of God. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 11, and verse 33, the Bible says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. Listen, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. So just as the ocean in many parts are unsearchable and past finding out, so are the judgments of the Lord. Now, this is the proof text of what we have all said or thought at some time or another, and we'll never fully understand all that the Lord does here on this earth because his judgments are past finding out. Amen. I'm glad that his ways are higher than my ways. I'm glad that his thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Now, look at the verse again. Look at the verse again. Psalm 36 and verse number six. Thy righteousness is like a great, is like the great mountains. Thy judgments are a great deep. Now listen to the last phrase. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. Now, when you read these verses about our wonderful God, you have a choice to make. Now, you think about this. We've only talked about five of the numerous characteristics of our God that are mentioned in this psalm. He's merciful. He's faithful. He's righteous. He is, he's merciful, he's faithful, he's righteous, and his judgments are um, past finding out, amen, how unsearchable are his judgments. So the Bible says, O Lord, thou preservest both man and beast. So when we read these verses and we find out these tremendous characteristics of our God, we have a choice to make. We can waste our time and we can waste our lives trying to save the planet or trying to save the animals that inhabit the planet. Or you can trust the fact that the Lord is merciful and the Lord is faithful and the Lord is righteous and just to keep his word and the promise that he's already made, O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. Now, I want to, I choose by the help of the Lord to be a good steward of all that the Lord has given me and all that the Lord has blessed me with. But listen, friend, I have no intention of wasting one minute of one hour of one day trying to save an animal from extinction or trying to save the earth from so-called global warming. You know why? Because we are not called to save the planet. Amen. We're not called to save the animals. The Lord, the Lord who is faithful the Lord who is merciful, the Lord who is righteous will preserve man 
and beast. Amen. That's you. You can you can junk a whole lot of things in this world if you just take God at His word and believe the Bible. Amen. He has called us to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to the souls of men that they might be saved. Now listen, if you're a believer. You claim to be a Christian and you spend your weekends, you spend your holidays, you spend your evenings rescuing animals and trying to save and trying to save the planet, but you will not spend the same amount of time or more time and energy and effort trying to rescue souls from eternity in a lake of fire, then you're not right with God. You say, preacher, I, I don't like that. Listen, I, I didn't say it to be liked. I am simply telling you that the Bible, the Lord has declared in his mercy, in his faithfulness, and in his righteousness that he will preserve both man and beast. You know what that means? That means that there's nothing that man can do to destroy man or beast. God has taken it upon himself to preserve both, amen, and he is well able to do so. We are not to be so uh, endeavored or endowed with these earthly-minded and temporal-minded things we're to be heavenly minded. Your neighbor, you're spending all of that time and all that effort and all that energy and your neighbor or your, even your own children or, or people in your own family don't know Jesus Christ as their personal savior. They're going to perish, per, uh, perish in the lake of fire for all eternity and you have no concern for them at all whatsoever, but you're trying to save the planet and you're trying to save an animal. Listen, friend, people are going to hell all around us. May God help us to be merciful, to be righteous, and to have some loving kindness, man, and reach those people with the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the very I love the way the Bible is put together. The very next verse says this, verse number seven, how excellent is thy loving kindness. Now, what a great place for this explanation. The previous verse ended with this phrase, O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. How excellent is thy loving kindness. And so the Lord, who is the creator of it all, is loving and kind, and he will preserve both man and beast. Now, let's look at all the verse. How excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Now, this verse contains the exaltation and praise of our great Savior. This is the very God that wicked men and wicked women are rejecting. This is the God that rebellious men do not fear. The wicked do not know this God and they have no idea what it is like to be under the shadow of his wings. This is the place where the righteous take refuge. Under his wings there is protection. Under his wings there is security. Under his wings there is rest. Under his wings there is warmth of God's love. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 23 and verse number 37, he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and you would not. Listen, this is the merciful, gracious, faithful God that is full of loving kindness. And this is the same God that multitudes are rejecting today. This phrase, under the shadow of thy wings, could also refer to the wings of the cherubim in the holy of holies of the tabernacle. We, we understand the, the terminology there, the wording there. And David could have been asking the Lord to make his hiding place in the holy of holies, the place of God's throne, the place of God's glory, protected by the angels of God. The Bible says in Psalm 57 and verse number one, 
It says, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Now, in the time of calamity, what a blessing it is to be able to be so near the blessed Savior under his wing, close enough to hear his heartbeat and feel the warmth and comfort of our Savior. Listen, friend, my time is quickly come and gone again today, but I'm glad that our God is merciful. I'm glad that our God is righteous. I'm glad that our God is faithful. I'm glad that the judgments of our God are right, and I am glad that his loving kindness is excellent. Amen. What a blessing to know Jesus. Goodbye, and God bless you until we meet again is our prayer. Thank you so much for uh, watching on our social media outlets. Please like and share the broadcast so that we might reach as many people as possible. Thank you so much. Goodbye, and good day is our prayer.